I'm, I'm already questioning whether I can be as um, entertaining and thought-provoking as all the previous speakers, so I'm already, I'm already uh, under a challenge there, which is good. Uh, my name is Stephen Halliwell. Um, I'm a Novartis in Basel, got the train down yesterday. Um, and I'm just going to... I've given my title a talk because I think it's kind of a common phrase in, 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 in England to talk about whether the, the, is the grass really greener on the other side? You move from academia to industry. And I, I keep this in because... Um, Richard Bannis is... Is it a choice? I think it's the other... Uh, the other one? Yeah. Yes, it is. Thank you. Could have taken a while, huh? So, I, I, and I like this because I found this joke um, on a Portuguese website, and it's kind of a, a physics joke, where, or a scientist joke, which, which fits, I think, where if you, if you look down on the graph, you can see the ground better through the grass blades because they're vertical, and if you look across the field over the fence. So I think, it, I, I love it, I love it. That's why it's in there. Anyway, so uh, three parts to my talk. Um, five minutes about Big Pharma, obviously concentrating on Novartis, so there's a bit of a sales pitch for that wonderful company on the right. Um, and then five minutes about me, and then five minutes about you. Okay, so, um, Novartis. So, um, it's a global, multinational, top 10 or top five pharma, or top one pharma, depending on which scale you choose. Um, our people always choose the scale that makes us nearest the top, obviously. Um, it is a uh, thoroughly research uh, and de development-based organization. It's currently organized into four groups. Uh, I suspect the majority of the people here would be interested in, in the top two, unless there are some ophthalmologists amongst you, uh, or, or some chemical engineers or process engineers that would work in the generic company sandbox. Uh, there's a clear effort to, to maintain research and development at the middle uh, of Novartis' uh, credo, uh, and this is um, surrounded by a set of functions that allow research and development to work within these four divisions. Um, the only other slide I have about Novartis or about Big Pharma in general is, is just, it's kind of a size thing. So we just heard from the CEO of a presumably still one person company, I don't know. All right. <laughs> Novartis is currently around 121,000 people in, we're represented in approximately 70 countries. Um, there's 12,000 people in Novartis in Switzerland. Uh, it's enormous. Uh, we turn over about 50 billion a year um, and we put 9 billion a year back into research and development. Okay. I'm in the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, which is a, which is a long name, so it's called NIBA. The Americans say NIBA. It's NIBA. Anyway, uh, there are about 6,000 of us. Uh, one thing about farmers is that there are continuous rearrangements. So we used to be spread around of five or six sites. We're now in fewer sites, so we're on the west coast, we're on the east coast, um, we're in Switzerland, uh, we're in Shanghai, and, and we're not in so many other places anymore. There's been consolidation in research as well. So those 6,000 have triggered um, greater than 500 clinical trials that are ongoing. I'll come back to that in a second. The number 400, it changes daily. That's a stupid thing to have on the slide. Uh, we make approximately, uh, we have approximately 90 new molecular entities running through the clinic. That, that's a key number for the people, uh, or the investors, I would say, looking at how we're doing compared to the competition. Um, innovation is a key word at Novartis, so new molecular, new molecular entities, enemies, um, are more popular with investors than me too's or fast followers, okay, where we try and copy someone else's work. Faster, better, whatever. So that's Novartis. You can ask me about Novartis afterwards if you like. Uh, now a little bit about me, um, my career. I've done what other people here have done and I put my career up. Um, I've done this before. Uh, you can read while I talk. Uh, I'm, I'm from the north of England. I don't talk like that anymore because no one will follow what I'm saying. So I've lost my accent, um, which is mainly good. Um, I did my degree in the south of England, which maybe was the start for that. Um, I did spend a year already in Basel, many, many, many years ago, 1990, um, before half of you were born, probably. Uh, I like being abroad so much that I applied abroad for a PhD and ended up back in the Beard Centrum. Feel a bad chance, come on to this. I've been to Bern for a postdoc, I went to MIT, uh, 
uh, came back to, to the Beard Junction, uh, and, and at a point across this line, I transitioned into industry. Okay? Uh, I was always a yeast cell biologist, not the thing you're thinking of if you want a job in industry. You don't do yeast cell biology, you don't do post biology sorting or tall serum reduction if you want a job in industry. And I wasn't thinking of a job in industry until 2005, when other things were starting to get rather tricky. Okay, uh, and I'm still in the Vartis, uh, um, changed, changed topics a couple of times, come back to this. Now let's analyze that from the point of view of, of how that happened. So the left hand side is what you just saw, and the right, and the right hand side is how it happened. And this is the, the I don't want to scare you, but it's true, okay. I got my sandwich here abroad because I just happened to be in that <coughs> professor's office when the facts came from Sibagaygi, and I didn't have my placement yet and all the other students had, and I turned down offers in Glaxo and Celtech because they were awful. And I was like, I'm not doing something I don't want to do, that's awful. So I'd, I'd, I'd been brave, and my professor was about to enter me in the three-year course, not the four-year course, and this fax came, I said, I'll do that. And the prof didn't want me to go because it was a prestigious place to go abroad for your, your undergraduate sandwich year, an internship, and um, I was a bit of a party boy, so I wasn't the one they wanted to send. But I persuaded him and I went, and I ended up with two publications from that year. So that, that was the start of something. And that turned me on completely to science. I mean, I was always like science, but that was the things that I want to do, a PhD, I want to carry on. So it was that going abroad year that was, was a decision-making moment for me. So that's the, and it was pure luck. <coughs> so don't, don't ever, you know, it's nothing else. Um, and so I carried on sort of in this vein, in this theme, if you like, where, um, I'd applied in, in EMBL in Heidelberg, and Pasteur in Paris, and ISREC in Lausanne, and in the Beard Centrum with Jeff Schatz. And I hitchhiked from Heidelberg to Bath to talk to him. And he said, yeah, you know, you can come and visit, but why don't you come and meet Howard and Mike Paul, and then see what they think of you? Because Jeff had already said he didn't want me. So I ended up in Mike Paul's lab, and the rest, as they say, is history, if you know the history of the tall pathway, um, culminating most currently in the Alaska Prize. So some of my publications with Mike are on the Alaska Prize page, which is pretty cool, actually. Great job. So um, I did a postdoc in Bern because we'd started collaborating from an observation I made, so I just went to Bern and carried on. We made that paper. I decided that Bern wasn't going to be the, the big ticket to whatever was next. I was still thinking of academia. So then I, I, I just wrote to a PI at Yale, Harvard, and MIT. I decided to stay in yeast, same organism, different biology. So I went from single transduction to post Golgi trafficking. Okay? So I ended up at MIT, um, uh, which was very good. Um, managed to publish. Uh, returned to Basel, but I could have gone to other places by then, and I was actually helped very much by Howard and, and others in the Department of Biochemistry in Basel to set up. But I didn't have a real position. I was on soft money, always writing money from Roche and Novartis to keep going. Um, and it was getting a bit tough, uh, and I wasn't churning out the papers as some others do. Uh, so, but I was surviving, and I was still having fun in the lab. I had three master students. We got stuff. Um, we got one, 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 two manuscripts out. One's still on my hard drive. It's going to stay on my hard drive forever. Uh, and then, and then it, it was, you know, I, I had people telling me, "You, are, you, you have two children. I have two small children. You're, you're, in, you're not looking after your family with this risky job." Every six months, I went to the head of the beard center to beg for money. Uh, but I was still doing science, and I loved it. And, and people said, you're irresponsible to your family. You're going to be on the street soon. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. OK. And then I got a phone call from someone I'd met during my PhD via Jeff Schatz. And it was Ram Mother from then Sandos, now Novartis. And he said, can you come for lunch tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. I actually looked after one of our students in my lab to do some experiments together on a machine we had. And you, you, I went for lunch the next day and offered me a job. They said, we're starting a yeast chemogenomics group. Same organism, same town, twice as much money. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you read these things in LinkedIn. Right, right. I, I had this decision point and it was, there was, it was very easy. I just said yes. Right? And then it, within 11 days, I signed the contract, which is actually a record for Novartis Human Resources. So uh, I see someone who knows is laughing there. It was in December, so they had a quota. I filled, filled the quota. And I never really looked back. I do, I do always question myself, 
if I if I just hung on and gone to be a professor in England or America or somewhere where it was a bit easier than Switzerland with my publication list, what would happen? It doesn't matter. Say so I'm in industry, and and what you learn there is you you learn enormous amounts of stuff. It's it's unbelievably complicated developing a drug. So I'm still learning 12 years later, and what happens is is that within industry, though things change. Okay, so um. You have to be very, very flexible. You have to manage lots of other interactions that you wouldn't normally do in academia. Um, and you have to sort of keep going, but you have to keep going with the science. So in, in all of that, you'll have seen that there's a lot of luck involved. I'm not going to embellish it, because I hear talks where people decided to. It's not true. It, it's pure luck, so there it is. But I, would, I like to call it engineered serendipity. And the engineering is that actually in every position I ever had, I did manage to get at least one paper out. And publications are the key, and they're still the key in industry, right? Because most industry scientists can't say, I got drug X to registration, because most don't, right? Most of us fail all the time. I've been a failure for 12 years at Novartis. I never even got into humans yet. I'm getting closer now, but uh, it's another story. Um, so uh, you, you do have to make papers, because it's the only currency you have externally, and also internally it's also important if you show yourself able to publish as well as drive the discovery projects. Okay. So that's the engineer serendipity. The other part is that I did have a network. I didn't even know the word network when I met Ram Mobber the first time, but I realized when I was doing this talk a year ago, similar talk, I'm like, now that is my network, and it worked actually. You know, I can, I'm too old to know these things, right? And there was never a careers talk like this in any of my, apart from MIT, which was professional operation of careers talk. So, what does my job look like today? The left-hand side is kind of what, um, the top bit's what professors do as well. They have people in their lab and they do experiments. Um, obviously, we have a different goal for discovery projects. I'll come on to that in a minute. Even within a large company where there's lots of strategy of management, it's still up to labs to come up with ideas within the framework of what they're told and drive innovation from the bottom up. Okay, so you're constantly you know, ha you know, hacking away at management for money to try something else with this company and money to try something else with this academic. So to be innovative while you do drug discovery. And there's a moment when the projects become full-on drug discovery projects and you just, you just push all the way through, okay? Um, on the right-hand side, there's all this other stuff you have to do. Some of these things you also have to do as a professor. Um, manage your manager, you have to manage the dean of your faculty, I guess. It's not, not so different. But there's lots of other things I didn't really do before that you also have to do. Um, and uh, they're all important, and you have to balance up all those things with your time. Okay. Um, because legally and officially, we only work 40 hours a week at the office. So, um, just a very brief comparison. I, I, I did this with a few other people. I asked for people about this. But the bottom line is that we don't do science differently from academics. We also make error bars. I would argue that we make better error bars than many academics because we're making hundred million dollar decisions based on some other parts. So, okay. I'll leave that there because I can get into a fight and there's less people from industry here than <laughs> academia. Um, we do the right experiment and we do very much the right experiment and only the right experiment because we spend more time worrying about which one is the experiment as a decision making experiment than might discover some other new factor in, in dynamic uh, rotation of membranes and whatever. Right? I used to worry about that too much. <laughs> Um, we also do fishing expeditions, uh, more so maybe than hypothesis driven experiments, depending on, on what we're actually doing at the time. Okay. So, um, academia, your major goal is publication to get grant money to get publication to get grant money to get publication. Okay. So, you're allowed to be as, once you've made, once you've got to a certain point and you're comfortable with your, your career and you've got tenure or whatever, or before, you're allowed to be just curiosity driven, which is great. And we need all of you people. Doing that because we feed off of your ideas as well. Uh, you can go as deep as you want in your topic. Uh, it doesn't have to be direct. You can just try something different. Uh, individual small groups, your lab. By definition, there's this big science thing which people think, well, there's more academic large consultants like NCCI clinical biology. Okay? You have to re you keep earning your resources to do your research, right? Um, even if your salary is fixed and you're, and you're happy with your CRNS position, you still have to get the research money to do the research. Industry is goal-oriented. We are only trying to 
Oh, sorry, at the very top, we are only trying to please investors on the official viewpoint, right? We do that by um, actually, uh, my focus is on patients, as is research. We aim to um, help the lives of patients uh, with whatever disease, improve their life or extend their life with an improved life. Okay. It's pipeline, it's drug discovery all the way through to registration um, in a major a regulatory area. It's goal oriented. The goal will change. My goal has changed every three or four years. Okay. Um, you're in a hurry, you're under pressure. You only do one decision experiment for any step of anything, it's linear. Um, uh, your, your breadth is limited. You, know, you, you have a certain thing you aim at, and that's it. Okay? Uh, you have an enormously more complex interaction with very many, many more disciplines than you wouldn't have to do, I would argue. Okay? Um, there is a hierarchy, there is a manager to please. I don't always please my managers because I'm a rather challenging individual. That, that can come back to you in ways you you don't expect. Okay, you are generally well resourced. That's not always the case, but generally. And basically, we can do any experiment in the world you can think of that someone's come up with. So within a within a month of CRISPR published in Nature, we were CRISPRing in our labs. Right? We got atomic force microscopes and light sheet microscopes, and we can do all this stuff. So your imagination is is allowed to full room to play um, biologically and technologically. These are kind of some of the uh, I've alluded to this. This is now about you because I get a lot of questions. I study, <coughs> what did I hear today? I study cognitive neuroscience. And this young lady was adamant that, that she couldn't get a job in the large pharma company. And I pointed out that if I was running a clinical trial in a neurodegenerative space, I need a cognitive neuroscientist to design the endpoint that I will persuade the FDA is, is that, that my drug is working. Okay. So uh, I hope I've changed her mind. Uh, there's lots of stuff here. I should now write artificial intelligence somewhere because it's the new buzzword. CRISPR's already boring and old. It's AI, AI, and I've, I've written IT. I need to put AI on it. Super trendy and current. I don't really know what AI is. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I'll ask the computer then. Um, so I hope you've seen your discipline. If you haven't, don't worry because there's also lots of room in industry for non research people that are just clever, bright, enthusiastic flexible, um, goal-oriented. And I think everyone likes to think of themselves as most, some or most of those things at some point in their scientific career. Okay. Um, this is a resource I found from a friend. It's by a computer scientist that's been in industry and academia gone back and forth in America. It's really good. So we've heard people saying they've consulted a private consultant to ask these questions of them. This paper has them all in, and these are the 10 themes. And I only found this a, a two years ago when I gave a careers talk, and I'm like, maybe I should have read that when I was at MIT. I don't know. Okay. So it's pretty good. So it's da David Searles, uh, plus Compile. And it's, it's also about, you know, you, you have to be honest with yourself. If you have a, a wife who is a lawyer, who works in Basel, and her law degree doesn't work outside of Switzerland, you're not going to leave Switzerland again, probably, unless you really earn lots of money and she's happy not working. Right? Uh, if you have children in high school and they've done, you know, 11 years of Swiss school and they're three years from the finish, you are not going to join a biotech in California that keeps calling you to go and join them because you can't rip your kids out of school. Right? So these are the realities that face me. Okay. So uh, you, this, is a, this is a really good way to think about yourself wherever you are in your career, and this is a reasonable a really good resource. It's 90% it's applicable to life science as well as computation. So I'm going to... Um, I wasn't watching my clock at all. I'm going to, I'm going to stop there uh, and take questions. And um, I'm around the whole one and a half days. Come and talk to me. People from large pharma companies don't bite. Thank you. Thank you very much.